It works. Um, well, thank you, Dominique, and thank you all for having me here to share my research with you. This is a collaborative project with Matt Baum from the Kennedy School. And the germ for this project emerged several years ago, well before the Donbass conflict began. We were looking at data from the Arab Spring uh, about the war in Libya. And as we were analyzing data from various sources, we found a, a, an interesting pattern, we thought. Uh, we, there were systematic differences in the types of events that were reported by different sources. Um, so sources from the West, United States, Canada, democratic countries, tended to place an emphasis on nonviolent protests against a violently repressive regime, uh, peaceful protesters standing up for their rights. Whereas sources from Russia, from China, from non-democratic countries uh, gave a very different perspective on the same events. Uh, peaceful protesters became violent extremists. Um, the uh, repressive government became legitimate authorities trying to restore law and order. Um, so different audiences were exposed to vastly different perspectives on the same exact events, depending on the political environment in which a media organization was based. We thought that was interesting. We wrote a paper about it. Uh, that paper explored the reasons for this variation in, in, uh, in reporting. Uh, in this project, we're looking at the consequences. Does it matter? And in particular, we're looking at two types of questions. First, um, how does reporting bias affect inferences about conflict, statistical inferences? Uh, how does it affect hypothesis testing? And by reporting bias, we mean so, um, selective coverage of events. Um, and our answer to this question is significantly. Uh, vastly different hypotheses are supported depending on which data sources you use. Um, and we demonstrate this by conducting a parallel analysis uh, of event data from Ukrainian sources, from Russian sources, from uh, sources in the so-called DNR and LNR. Um, and we find, first of all, uh, that media organizations in both of these places mostly report violence by the other side. More than that, um, so Ukrainian media mostly report rebel violence, and by rebel I mean both local uh, DNR, LNR uh, forces and uh, Russian volunteers, potentially Russian troops. Uh, Russian and rebel media mostly report on government violence. More than that, they mostly report on indiscriminate violence by the other side. And so, this leads to contradictory predictions about how a conflict is likely to unfold. If a ceasefire is in place, which side is more likely to violate it? And then the next question for us, well, so what? Who cares? Does this matter for people other than political scientists? Uh, our answer is yes. Um, <laughs> and, and we have a survey experiment, which was not Part of the paper that we circulated here due to space constraints, uh, but in the survey experiment, uh, we exposed uh, uh, experimental subjects to uh, otherwise identical media reports where we only vary the actor and the tactics being used. And we found that depending on uh, the actor and tactics being, being reported, um, public opinion about this war will change. Um, essentially, survey uh, respondents supported military action against whichever side was supported to be committing the violence. Whether um, this is a fictitious country X scenario, but um, well, what we argue is that the types of reporting biases that we see in Ukraine aren't quite bad for conflict resolution. Uh, they polarize audiences on both sides. Uh, they harden attitudes against negotiated settlement, harden attitudes for military action. Of course, is this, if this is the effect that you want to achieve, uh, if you want to mobilize increased support for your side, then this is exactly the type of media coverage that you should continue pushing out. Um, but um, from the standpoint of reducing violence and bringing this conflict to an end, uh, we feel that the results were somewhat more disquieting. So here are the data sources that we looked at. Uh, these are essentially 17 different event data sets from various sources, or from Russia, from Ukraine, uh, from the rebel territories. Uh, television uh, coverage, such as Channel 5, um, OSCE reports from the special monitoring mission in the, in the Donbass, uh, rebel sources, such as uh, Ruska Vesna, Newsfront, uh, Donetsk News Agency. Uh, we also have Russian 
web and, uh, and television sources. We even have a, uh, an independent television station, um, the Dorst, uh, and, um, and Wikipedia as well. Uh, why not? Uh, it's a crowdsourced international version of these events. And what do these different sources say about the same events? So here is an average um, event about uh, rebel violence from Ukrainian media on, on the left and from Russian media on the right, Channel 5, Lientaru. Um, so uh, Ukrainian media, uh, these are the same, the same events that are reported, the same ones that are, that are reported in the OSCE special monitoring mission reports, the same exact incidents of violence. Ukrainian media uh, focus on shelling by terrorists, uh, whereas Russian media, terrorists uh, become uh, you know, one man's terrorists or another man's freedom fighters. Uh, and the shelling incidents uh, are given less emphasis. What's emphasized more heavily here is detentions, arrests uh, by these Apolchensi, uh, Zakhvatili, Ukrainskich Silovikov. So that's the typical average uh, Russian media report of, um, of uh, rebel violence. When we look at government violence, mirror image. Um, Ukrainian media focus on detentions by, not even by the army, but by the SBU. Uh, and SBU is a terrorist. And rebel media focus on shelling by Ukrainian troops. Siloviki, Abstiliali. Uh, I think it says up there somewhere. Um, there's also things uh, about violating the ceasefire, uh, and so on. Um, so you get the point. Same events, different focus. Um, and if we were to place all these all these sources on a on a continuum, here we used um, uh, similar methods that are used in American politics to look at election uh, polling. Uh, different polling firms have different so-called house effects. Uh, according to one firm, Trump may be leading. According to another firm, Hillary may be leading. Uh, we applied the same methods to these different events uh, using OSCE as the baseline. And as you would expect, Ukrainian sources are much more likely than the OSCE to report on rebel attacks. Uh, rebel and Russian sources, and especially rebel sources, uh, are much more likely to report on government violence if you are to use these data for statistical analysis, I strongly suggest that you do not use the Donetsk News Agency. Um, <laughs> they're all the way out of the right, almost exclusively reports of government violence. Um, and uh, of course, we control for a lot of other things. Uh, country affiliation is not the only thing that determines whether an act of violence is attributed to a certain group. Sometimes there are simply more witnesses in some places, uh, big cities, coastal roads, uh, there's also demand side factors, such as, um, well, there's a bad news bias. The, m the more people die, the more readers like to read about it. Right? That's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Um, and the closer the event is to the front line, the more salient it is to political audience. Um, we count for all that. Uh, net of all these things, these uh, source biases still assert themselves very heavily. And if we were to place all these sources on a, on a time scale, trying to construct a time series of the conflict. That line in the middle that you see here, the black line with a, with a purple bar, is uh, a, the latent level of violence that we estimated from the OSCE reports. Um, and, uh, and this is a weighted average from all these different media sources, uh, intensity of violence over time. And some of the things, well, there are spikes in this distribution where you would expect them to be. Uh, the January offensive by the D DNR, LNR, the summer of 2014, obviously, there are drops in violence after the ceasefire agreements. But throughout, throughout, above the line, above this, the, the, this baseline are almost exclusively Ukrainian sources, these blue dots. Um, below the line are mostly orange and red, or, or red dots. So what this means is that relative to the OSCE, um, Ukrainian sources overreport rebel violence. Rebel and, and Russian sources underreport rebel violence, um, which is not to say that either of these represents the truth. And using OSCE as the baseline is a big assumption that we're making. Uh, but relative to that baseline, uh, there's a clear separation in the types of events that are covered. Uh, beyond this, um, if we were to look at how these groups are attacking, the types of tactics that are being used, um, Ukrainian sources, um, uh, for any given 
uh, event of rebel violence that are reported in Ukrainian, rebel, Russian, and, and, and other sources, Ukrainian media are much more likely to focus on indiscriminate attacks, uh, shelling, uh, rockets. Whereas, um, yeah, so the, the probability that for, in, for an average event of rebel violence reported in Ukrainian sources, uh, that's about a 70, well, about, yeah, about a 70 percent chance that that incident will be a case of shelling rather than a, an arrest or, or an assassination. Uh, complete opposite picture, of course, in Russian and, and rebel sources. Um, two minutes, yeah, complete opposite picture in, uh, uh, for indiscriminate government attacks. Um, and so to see whether this actually affects public opinion, we conducted a survey experiment on Amazon Mechanical Turk um, in which we uh, exposed subjects to a news story in which we only changed who was attacking, what kind of violence they were using. So this is the, the basic report. Hundreds are missing in, in the rebel war-torn country this week as rebel forces escalated operations against suspected government supporters. Uh, 200 are missing after a series of assassinations and detentions. And so for treatment two, assassinations become artillery shelling. Treatments three and four, rebel forces become government forces. Um, and the control group has no information about tactics uh, or actors. Um, like shelling happened, we don't know who did it. Uh, or some kind of violence happened. And um, perhaps it's not surprising, uh, but the more information subjects got about who was, be who was involved in the event and what they were doing, uh, the more likely they were to support intervention. And even to a greater extent, the more likely they were to support taking sides in this conflict. So in, in answering the question, should there, should, should there be an international response, uh, it was about a 2% increase in, in the subjects who said, uh, yes, there should be an intervention among those who were exposed to any information about actors and tactics. It was about an 8% rise in support for taking sides. Uh, who did they take sides against? Um, whoever was framed as being uh, responsible for the violence. Um, and we found that information about actor, actors here is actually much more important than information about tactics, about whether the violence is selective or indiscriminate. Um, so the, the uh, circles here, the, the open circles are indiscriminate violence, the closed circles are selective. Um, and so in the blue section above where the treatment is a report on government violence, I mean, subjects who were exposed to reports of government violence were, less, were more likely to support anti-government action, less likely to support uh, anti-rebel action, and that was roughly the same whether the, the violence is selective or indiscriminate. And then the final result I'm going to show you um, is uh, we look at different scales of intervention, everything from economic sanctions to direct military intervention. And what we found is that these reporting biases have the strongest effect actually on uh, support for military intervention, less so for economic sanctions, unless it's your country that has to do the intervening. Um, and so. Um, so, so when we asked about intervention by the international community, uh, response, responses in, in, in both groups it, it, um, were um, very much in favor of, of military intervention, whereas um, uh, particularly against the government side, um, uh, the response was much more muted uh, for actions taken by your country, uh, actions by your country in, in, in the shape of economic sanctions uh, received much more support in that case. So to conclude, um, all knowledge is futile. Uh, there is no objective truth. Eventually, all of us will die. Uh, <laughs> what else? Uh, <laughs> Survive the election of Tuesday. <laughs> I'm in Canada, aren't I? <laughs> I'm right here. Um, so anyway, uh, local sources focus on violence by the other side. Outside sources like the OSCE, even Russian media are much more cautious about attributing violence to each side. Actually, Russian sources tend to use the passive voice a lot. Shelling happened. We don't know who did it. Um, could be anyone, I guess. Um, but the result here is that for social scientists, we you know, basically have to be very careful about the sources of the data that we use. These lead to contradictory predictions about how the conflict will unfold. Um, and you know, these selective coverage can potentially shape policy preferences in non-trivial ways. Uh, less neutrality, more support for intervention. Um, if that's what you want, then yeah, we can. Uh, then there's very little to object to in this media coverage on either side. But if uh, what you want to do is stop the violence, uh, 
uh, and somehow find a resolution to the conflict, come to the negotiating table. Uh, this kind of re reporting bias is bad news.